But I want to take about 15 minutes and give you an introduction to this word. And, and I, just, I, I want to talk about three questions that you can ask yourself to start the new year off well. You can start this new year off well. In some studies, back in 2016, there was a study done on how many of us actually make New Year's resolutions. And maybe you're in that camp that you make New Year's resolution or you have a goal, a plan, a strategy to do something different this year. But back in 2016, about 51% of people would do so. So you're in the top 50 percentile if you uh, did so. Now in 2022, it's dropped some say the pandemic kind of took the wind out of people's cells and we don't have a lot to control in our lives, so why even bother? But about 38.5%, uh, according to a particular study, will set New Year's resolutions. 18 to 34-year-olds are 60% more likely to, about 60% of that demographic will. And some of us that are a little older than 34 might go, Oh, that's cute. They're naive, right? They're going to set up these new goals, these new resolutions, and they're going to try to do better. They're going to try to do more, and they've got this in their mind. And, and then the, the top three, you could probably guess, the top three New Year's resolutions all deal with health. I want to exercise a little bit more. I want to lose weight, right, because we have just had a great time with Thanksgiving and Christmas, or I want to be healthier. Now, men will track a little bit closer to, I want to advance in my career. So we lay out these New Year's resolutions. But did you know that, so 48% of your New Year's resolutions is, I want to just exercise a little bit more. 23% of people that make New Year's resolutions Quit in the first week. Just here to be an encouragement today. Here to say, go get them for a week. Right? Did you know the second Friday of this month is called Quitter's Day? The second Friday of January, we ought to get a cake throw a party here on Friday night and just eat it, right? Some of you that are like doing the Daniel fast, you're like, please, God, no. I'm asking for no temptation and my pastor's trying to throw a party on Quitter's Day. We're not gonna do that. But here's part of the mentality. When surveyed, 43% of people that do make New Year's resolutions expect 43% that set up New Year's resolution. They've written it down. And you know the stat, if you write it down, you're more likely to do it. Not so fast. 43% of people that will write down or make or state a, a New Year's resolution expect to fail before February. So your attitude towards these New Year's resolutions is an attitude of failure. An expectancy that I'm not going to get one-twelfth of the way through the year before I throw in the towel and I'm done. Well, I want to just give you three questions. I'm not telling you to make New Year's resolutions necessarily. I'm not telling you you need to go home and to, to write out a list of what you're going to accomplish this year. But I do believe that God has a future for you. And I do believe that God has a, a, a new level of intimacy with him. And, and I do believe that he wants to bless you. And I believe that he wants to prosper you. I believe he wants to give you a future and a hope. I don't believe he wants to harm you. I don't believe he wants you to be living in, in lack and in bondage and in brokenness. I believe he wants you to see his goodness in your life. And so I want to just give you a couple of things that may frame this. In, in a, one, one more little note here. Those that asked folks, why don't you get it done? Well, 35% said just lack of motivation. Those that were successful, those that came through and said, I was able to check the box and I accomplished my New Year's resolutions, they, they were most likely to experience 14 slip-ups in a two-year cycle or a two-year interval. So about seven times in this year, you can expect 
to fall or to fail at accomplishing the goal that you have set out? What are you going to do about it? Do you have a resiliency? Do you have a stick to itness that will help you get through it? Three quick questions, and I believe they can be put into every category. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to walk you through how to apply these to your career, to your, to your relationships, to your finance, to your physical health, to your mental health, and to your spirituality. I will trust that you can figure out how to apply these questions and ask these questions in these different arenas of your life because they can be applied. But a simple question as you enter into 2023, you maybe you want to pray over these questions over the next week or so. You don't have to have all of these outlined and laid out today, but you can start asking the Lord, in what areas of my life would I like to gain more knowledge? Where would I like to grow in my knowledge? Here's what just common sense and and, uh, contemporary literature will say or, or wisdom will say about this. Knowledge is power, correct? And so if you want more power, and I'm not talking about uh, power to control, but I'm talking about power to walk in freedom, power to walk in success. If you could ask this question in my life, where do I want to grow in my knowledge? If knowledge is power, where do I want to acquire more knowledge? You can do this in all of those arenas of your life, in your career, in your, in your, uh, your relationships. In relationships, how do you acquire knowledge? You ask questions. You begin to ask questions. How am I doing? How am I doing as a dad? How am I doing as a husband? How am I doing as a friend? Ask open-ended questions. Don't ask yes or no questions. You ask yes or no questions, especially if kids, you're gonna get yes or no answers. Correct? How am I doing? Good. All right, start asking questions, enter into conversation. But you can do this in all the arenas, but the most important arena is in your spirituality. How am I, what area of my life do I wanna gain knowledge in my spirituality? Maybe some of you are very versed in Old Testament. You love the stories. You love the stories of the Old Testament and you have studied the stories of the Old Testament. You love David and Goliath. You love David's mighty men. You love to read the prophets and how they operated and the weird quirkiness about some of those guys. And you're like, he laid on his side for, and and you just get into those details and, and you love these stories, but you're a little weak in your knowledge of the epistles or, or how the church is to govern or the, the theology of grace that's throughout Paul's letters. So maybe this year through prayer, you say, I want to acquire knowledge in a particular area. Maybe you're a New Testament person and, and you get bogged down in the old, but, but you want to say, I want to focus a little bit of my life. I want to acquire some knowledge. Why do we want to acquire knowledge? You acquire knowledge through reading the Word of God. Spiritual knowledge is acquired or garnered by reading the Word. As you engage the Word, here's what we know about the Word. The Word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It will not return void, but it will accomplish the very thing that He sends it forth to do. And if you're looking to grow in your life, you're looking to grow in your knowledge, read the Word. Simply read the word intentionally, prayerfully, and maybe even strategically. A lot of us, you know, we are a, if you didn't know this by now, you might need an evaluation, but we are a Pentecostal church, right? If you sat through this service and and didn't realize that we are a spirit-filled Pentecostal church, good for you. But we are a spirit-filled church, and sometimes we approach reading of the Word just so haphazardly. I'm not trying to shame anybody. I could feel the, your, your, your body start to sweat. You know, just flip open a scripture and boom. Or what's the verse of the day on version? That'll be my scripture for the whole day today. And you pull that out and you read that one verse and we're good. But if you will intentionally dig into the Word, your knowledge, your power base will grow. Your spiritual authority will be strengthened as you feed on the word of God. So ask, and you can, again, all across the board, in your career, there's, there's websites, you can Google it, right? How do, in my industry, is knowledge changing? In my industry, have methodology shift? So you can get, garner, you can acquire knowledge in any field, relationships, how am I doing, right? In your physical health, How am I doing? In your mental health, how am I doing? There was a season in my life that I thought I was doing amazing with my mental health. 
I thought I was, if you had asked me, Jeremy, how are you doing? I was sitting on my porch looking out over my sheep and my dogs and my property, and I was drinking a cup of coffee. And if you'd walked up and said, how are you doing? I'd have said, I'm about a three or a four in my mental health. I'm feeling pretty good on my stress level. I received one phone call, and I went to an 11 on a scale of one to 10. And three miles later, walking my property, not controlling my tongue, I wounded people in my life because I didn't have the awareness of where I really was in my health that day. I was right in the middle of COVID and I thought I was handling it well, but I was preaching to that little camera back there every week and there wasn't one of you in the building. And I was getting emails from some of you saying, until you mandate masks, we won't come back. And until you don't even suggest masks, we're not coming back. I got that email on the same day. One from one of you and one from the other. I almost forwarded them to each other. <laughs> Said, y'all work this out and tell me what God says. <laughs> right? I'm telling you, I was... And I thought I was handling it well, but I was right here. So ask questions. How do you gain knowledge? Smart people ask questions. They don't assume they know it all. So ask yourself, ask the Lord, how am I doing? Ask, ask somebody that lives with you, how am I doing in mental health? And if they go, well, you go, you can get back to me on that. So ask questions. Seek wisdom. Dive into the word. So that's one question. That's one arena of our lives that we can. And then secondly, maybe you want to ask in 2023, in what area of my life do I want to be different? Now, this one's hard. This one's interesting. Gaining knowledge is you can sign up for a class. You can go get a degree. You can get a certificate. You can do any of that. And you can, you can grab a book and read it. And you gain knowledge. Get into the word. You're going to gain knowledge. But when you start asking, how can I be different? Like, I want to be more peaceful. I want to be more loving. I want to be more kind. I want to be less stressed. 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 Get stressed over being not stressed, right? I'm not going to be concerned about that. I'm not going to think about that anymore. And then we fixate on it. So how do you be different? Well, this is just who I am. This is how I'm wired, all right? How do you be different? Well, being is unique. It requires, and, and in all your areas, like I want to be more faithful at work. I want to be punctual at work, right? Like you can have that goal, but if, you're, if you don't have a, here's the, the key for me. If you don't have a revelation of your identity of who you really are, the trying to be something that you're not will never really work out. And that's not an excuse to say this is just who I am, so deal with it. I, heard a, uh, I don't know if he's a good comedian, so don't, don't go start Googling it. I don't know. I saw one little bitty, tiny, tiny, tiny clip. And this comedian said, I used to make fun of millennials until I Googled it. And then I realized I am one. And I am not, but this is what he said. And he said, but what I have discovered about millennials is we are the most self-aware group ever, and he said, but what we do is we're so self-aware, but we don't do anything about it. He'll say, somebody comes up and says something, he's, oh, whoa, 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 I've got anxiety. And he goes, well, what are you doing about that anxiety? Are you seeing somebody? No, 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 I'm letting you know about it so you can work around my anxiety. Sometimes in our knowledge of who we are, we're just making excuses to continue in the behavior that we're in. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying get a revelation of who you are. And then you take it to the Lord in prayer. So when you're asking yourself in, in these areas of my life that I wanna, I wanna grow, I wanna be different, the way that transformation comes about is through prayer. How do I acquire, how do I get this acquisition of knowledge? That is through reading. 
So you dive into the Word of God, you read the Word of God, you gain knowledge but for the transformation. Now, the Word of God will wash and cleanse because it is unlike any other book. It is unlike any other TED Talk or any other thing out there. It transforms you. So as you read the Word, you are a new creation. And when you get a Scripture that is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and you say, I am no longer a sinner simply saved by grace, but I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Behold, all that old junk passes away. I crucify the flesh, and I am a new creation in Christ Jesus because he who knew no sin became sin for me in my place. And on the cross, he absorbed all of the wrath of God so that now an imputation, I have imputed, accredited, deposited righteousness into my life. I didn't do righteous things to become righteous. I received righteousness, and now I am seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and this is who I am. I am son, not soldier. I am son, not servant. I am daughter, not servant. I am daughter, not a soldier. I am a child of God, and I have all access to the throne. When you have a revelation, it transforms you, and you have a peace that passes all understanding. And then the, the last one, which is easy, and I believe this is where most New Year's resolutions start. What do I want to do differently in life? So when we start with what I want to do without a revelation of who I am, we're trying to do things that are incongruent with who you are. Is that too much? Okay, I'm going to back up. Rewind. When we start with what we want to do and what we do want to accomplish in life, without a revelation of who we really are, most of our lists of what we want to do are really incongruent with the character and the nature of who we really are deep down inside. Unless you are just God-gifted with discipline and drive and you love spreadsheets and you love to check the boxes, and when you're so goal-oriented as a person, when you write that new goal down, it becomes a driving force in your life. Unless you're wired like that, then just making a list of things you want to do won't come to pass, and 43% of you expect to fail before February rolls around. And 23% will fail by the end of this week because there is no revelation of who I really am. And we try to just do things to get them done. And if you remember that little bitty statistic, we're, we're preparing to close in just a moment. After I give you a chapter of the Word of God. When, when the successful people through these processes, these New Year's resolutions said, we fall seven times. We fail at this seven times. The Word of God says the righteous fall seven times, but they get back up. Why? Because there is not performance mentality connected. Our identity is in that we are the righteousness of God not in my performance, not in my success or in my failure. Because if it's in your success, then you get prideful and say, I've checked every box for the past six weeks and I'm a gift for God, right? And, and that's a failure in and of itself because doing the task without the transformation of the heart really means very little. And so when you enter in, though, and you go, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I am secure in my identity, and righteousness is not doing righteous things. It is the character and the nature of God being imputed into me. I am made in his image. And when I have a revelation of my identity, then when I fail at a task, when I fail at something, I can get back up because my identity isn't in my performance. It is in my identity, in my, my security with him, and I can get myself up. I can dust myself off and go, this failure does not mark me, and now I'm going to walk on into his promises. Amen. It gives us the resiliency I'm not defined by my failures. Here's the scripture. Matthew 6, Jesus talking. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And I'm not telling you not to say, I want to be better in my career. But that's not my treasure. 
That's my stewardship. I want to steward my career well and be a faithful steward. But I'm not trying to lay up a treasure to garner and to gain wealth just for myself. So don't lay up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also powerful. The eye is the lamp of the body. What you see, what you read, what you feed on will uh, make you who you are. So if the eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So when we're laying out our New Year's resolutions and there is a heart attachment to the wealth, there's a heart attachment to the career, there's a heart attachment to that treasure. And then at the same time over here, you go, I want to pray a little bit more. I want to read a little bit more. You're not going to serve both masters. Better serve the Lord wholeheartedly and allow him to anoint you to steward these other things. It's challenging, isn't it? It's a little painful. Some of you are like, have you been reading my New Year's resolution? I'm gonna be a millionaire by the end of the year. If your heart's pure, amen. But if it is your treasure, woe unto you. Amen? Because I I am praying for multimillionaires. I'm praying for somebody to be able to write a check for a million dollars to help pay for this heart for the house. The entire thing, just write a check for a million. If you've got that today, take it straight to Pastor Paul. No, like now. Like, we were going to clap for you. Do not be anxious. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barn, into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Always blows my mind. Are you not of more value than they? I don't think the birds are praying and freaking out, and God takes care of them. Now, we're, not, we're, we're supposed to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. But we're not supposed to, and the theological term is, you're not supposed to freak out. You're not to have this anxiety that grips you. And which of you, by being anxious, this hits home, doesn't it, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and then tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not... Be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So it's not bad to need them. He knows you need them. But in our desire of being better, in our desire of doing more, in our desire of of growing in certain areas over this next year, don't let anxiety, don't let fear, don't let a, a worldly passion and lust for these things be your motivation. Allow it to be a stewardship heart. Here's what it says. Here's, here's the key verse. Here's the whole point. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. As you maybe pray through, I don't know if you'll do this. I don't know if you'll take this to heart and pray through these three questions and apply them to your life. But as you do so, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And again, what is his righteousness? Is a revelation of your identity in him. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Don't read that, I'm seeking first his righteousness and these are the spiritual things that I need to do to be better. Read, I am seeking his righteousness as a revelation of my identity in him, that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you'll get a revelation of that in 2023, you will be anxious for nothing and all of these other things will be added unto you 
and you'll be gifted to steward them. Can you stand with me this morning as we prepare to bring this new year in with communion? If you did not receive communion on your way in, if you'll just raise your hand. We've got an usher that's coming by with all the hands raised. They'll be by in the next 20 minutes. A lot of y'all snuck in here, didn't you? We want to taste and see that the Lord is good. We do this every year because we believe. We do this every week because we believe this is powerful. This isn't just religious. This isn't just liturgy. But we believe that the Lord says you can taste and see that I am good. You can come to the table and you can receive all that you have need of in him. If you haven't received, if you just keep your hand up, we'll make sure you get it. If you're at home, if you'll prepare the elements, grab something. We come to the table. As often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. And we are able to declare over our lives his death. It's what the word says. We are declaring his death over our life which means we're prophesying, we're speaking all of the benefits. Psalm 103 says, I will forget not all of your benefits. You heal us of diseases, you deliver us, you forgive us of all of our sins. There are benefits in the kingdom. There are benefits in the new covenant. A better blood, a better mediator, a better high priest. So under the new covenant, Lord, we come to the table, even in the presence of our enemies, you anoint our head with oil and our cup runs over. We taste and see that the Lord is good. We receive the manna from heaven, the bread of life. We receive sustenance for our life. Give us this day all of our needs, Lord. Supply, Lord. These elements now, they're sanctified, they're holy, they're set apart. They represent you. And on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he told them to take and eat for this is my body and we receive in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your supply, that you are the word of God, that you are the bread of life. Give us this day our daily bread. we receive from you spiritual nourishment. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks for it and he gave it to his disciples and he told them, he said, take and drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that is poured out, shed for the remission of sin in the new covenant and we receive in Jesus' name. Lord, you are good, you are gracious and you are holy. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you laid down your life. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your son, your one and only son. And as we call on the name of the Lord, we are saved. And if there's anyone, Lord, in this house that has not called on your, on your name, they've not believed in their heart, confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Savior, I pray that today is the day of salvation and that they'll come to know you by confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart calling on the name of the Lord for whosoever shall be saved. We give you praise. We have prayer team members that are going to come this way. And if you need prayer in any area,